My name is Vikeshni. Thank you for joining us. We're starting at nine o'clock today. I'm just going to go through a few of the technical bits before we start, just so that you understand how some of the functionalities work. As you've seen now, I've shared our first poll with you, asking whether or not you attended last week's session. And we can see a majority of us have attended last week. So thank you again for attending. Um, and there's a few of us who have not attended previously. So I'm going to stop share at this point. And I just wanted to show you how the poll looks and what it comes up, especially for those who may not have attended a webinar before, um, so that you know how the functions work. Our speaker today will be running a few polls through her session, and we will use that functionality. So Shane did introduce you already to the Q&A function. And I'm going to ask everyone if you could please use your Q&A function there to only pose questions to our speaker. So our speaker will be looking at this uh, window during the Q&A session, and she'll be picking some questions from here to answer. So if we can limit uh, this section here just for your questions to the speaker, and we're going to use the chat, the chat function to actually pose any technical issues or to respond to open text questions. So for your chat, if you toggle down to your screen at the bottom, you will see a menu that pops up similar to where we had the Q&A and next to it, you should have a chat button. And I can see already there are a lot of people already on the chat group. So for those who've just opened it, could you maybe tell me where you are dialing in from today? We've got some people from Cape Town, Paul, Pretoria, KZN, East London, someone from Kenya, welcome. That's great to see our members outside of South Africa joining in, Botswana, Lesotho. So we've got a really an array of attendees this morning. Fantastic. Great. So we can see everyone how the chat function works. The chat function allows you to chat to um, the fellow attendees in this morning session. Also, the speaker may ask some open questions um, that require some text and you can respond through the chat function here. Also, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can put um, your questions here on the chat or you can use the Q&A for that as well. And we will on the back end assist you if you have any issues. So that really is from me, the technical aspects. Um, one last thing is on a webinar, nobody can see your uh, face. You will only be able to see our speaker's um, view and uh, you won't be able to hear your voice. I however, will during the Q&A, we'll have a little bit of an open mic session right towards the end to allow a little bit of engagement and um, we will give specific people um, uh, to unmute themselves and be able to ask a question directly. So do stay on for the Q&A session. And also, if you happen to leave in the middle of our opportunity for you to um, suggest any future topics. So without further ado, I'm going to start today's session and welcome everyone to the second Boardroom Bites at 9 a webinar. Today, our topic is on how to deal with Black Swan events and the elephant in the room uh, by our speaker, Sherry Lee Merland. Sherry Lee has extensive experience in risk management and is the past president of, of IRMSA and a current member of South Africa's Integrated Committee's Technical Working Group. She has participated on numerous governance and risk conferences and provides insights to clients on leading practices in risk management and integrated reporting. I'm going to ask Shirley to put on her camera and her sound so that you can all see her in order for me to hand over. Um, our session today is broken up into a 30 minute presentation and then uh, Shirley will open up the Q&A sessions. I will be back a bit later on to help with the Q&A and say goodbye. So everybody, uh, over to Shirley and please enjoy today's session. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
I greet you today from the comfort of my home in these absolutely unprecedented times. This is a very first online presentation for myself and uh, the second, as you heard, in the Institute of Directors uh, um, at 9am Bytes. So it's absolutely wonderful to be with you and this on lock day, lockdown day number 20, lockdown. Whoever could have imagined that in our lifetimes we would have been locked down. I, I just struggled to get my head around that. Um, whoever would have thought? Who would have known? Ladies and gentlemen, you'll be sitting perhaps in your homes. Some of you might be in your offices if you're allowed to be there. But our world is so different, the world that we knew. There are no airplanes in this beautiful blue sky that I'm looking up at now. They've been grounded. The airports are closed. Schools are closed. Our borders are closed. There's restrictions on funerals. I mean, people are dying even from natural causes. And we're not just able to go to celebrate their lives. There was no church for those of us who celebrate Easter this weekend. Can you imagine the thousands of people who make their way up year after year to the Mariah Church celebrations in the far north of our country? Our loved ones who were away at the time of lockdown, they haven't been able to return to South Africa. And when they do return, what then? And when they are able to return, a date that is unknown to us, where to then? Our children, we can't visit them. Our children can't visit us. We can't visit people in hospital who are sick. In many countries around the world where people are dying at a daily rate, which is just hard to believe, in particular Italy, uh, the numbers are very high in the USA as well, you can't be with them when they need you at their very worst of times. The shops are closed. The shopping malls are closed. Weddings have been postponed. And then for the sport lovers in our midst, and I'm sure there's many of you, there are so many of these. Many of you would have been preparing to participate in the Two Oceans Marathon. It's not happening. The Olympics, Super Rugby, the SA International Cricket, Formula One, many of the PGA golf tournaments. Good news for those of you who love the Tour de France. That hasn't been canceled, but it's been postponed. And Wimbledon. Do you know that this will be the first time since World War II that Wimbledon won't be taking place? And then we're dealing with all sorts of fake news. Fake news that sets panic amongst people and just builds up such negativity. This is one of my fears and something that I'll deal with later. Small businesses have closed. and not sure if they will be able to open again. Will they make it through this? Will they be able to bounce back and recover? There's real hardships, people. We know that. Staff who rely on a daily wage or the tips that we um, hand out when we are enjoying our meals at restaurants, which are closed now. Those who are reliant on weekly wages. Hairdressers, nail technicians, people who provide a service. They're just not earning any money. There are people who are not able to feed themselves because they are not earning any money. Oh my goodness, the level of overwhelm, the disbelief, it is absolutely unprecedented. And as we come to terms with the emergence of this black swan, COVID-19 or the coronavirus, there have to be some upsides and we're going to deal with them later. So my, I was going to ask you, um, and the poll doesn't allow this, but I spoke to you about my word, unprecedented. And if you'd like to share with us on the, um, on the chat what your word is, I think it's important for us to be able to uh, share with each other that it, it, it is a big deal. This, it's, um, it's quite like something un, 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 absolutely unrecognizable and, and, and not part of our frame of reference.
So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pause there now and to look at what the definition is of a black swan. And many of you will be familiar with the work of Nassim Taleb, who is notorious for his work and his book that he wrote about black swans. But let's just have a look at that together. A black swan is, event in a, is an event in which the probability of occurrence is low, but the impact is very high. And this is where it differentiates itself from anything else. It is a complete surprise. No one could have imagined its size and the scope. People and organizations are shocked by its overwhelming impact. When it's all over, the new normal that we will experience bears absolutely no resemblance to the past. It's radical, it's disruptive, and it's a game changer for those who go through it and for those that are impacted by it. The world is never quite the same again. When you think back, and you'll have other examples, I'm sure, two that stand out for me, 9-11, and then the most recent, of course, is the one that we're living right now. To unpack a little bit more about black swans, some of you will also um, be familiar with something that Donald Rumsfeld once said when he was justifying his invasion of Iraq at the time. And he spoke about known knowns and unknown knowns. And what that really meant is that sometimes we know about things and sometimes we just don't know about things. And on the screen in front of you, you'll see a little bit of an unpack of what that all means. In the risk world in particular, there are known unknowns. And, and there, there is an element of uncertainty that remains. So it's a risk that we're dealing with, but we know about it. So in our organizations, we are able to put uh, assign risk, uh, roles and responsibilities to a particular risk type that's there. We're able to define it, understand it, uh, ensure that we have mitigating actions in place to make sure that it, it is well managed. On the other side, the known knowns, this is where there's absolute certainty about an event. It's happened. We've, there are facts, we've incurred the losses, we understand the issue, um, it's typically incidents or events, and, and as I say, there's absolutely um, uh, certainty around it. We're aware of them and we understand these things. What we may want to do in this instance here is understand why they happened. So your organization might be very keen on doing root cause analysis and understanding what caused that significant loss or that event to transpire and what is the real fix that we need to attend to. Is there a set of controls? Of what, cha what changes are required? So a, a real good tool there is to apply some risk, root cause analysis in your organization. And then those unknown unknowns, and, and that's really why we are here today. Um, these are the things that we're neither aware of nor understand. Um, they're absolute surprises, and you, you heard me say in my introductions, who would have thought? Who would have thought that we were in lockdown? Who would have thought that there could be a pandemic of this nature, a complete black swan? And then just looking at things that are unknown, but known, and that's a very important differentiation. The black swan, we, we couldn't anticipate it. However, in organizations, it does happen that there are some people who know that things may happen, but they don't speak about it. And this speaks a lot about the culture. They may feel that they, they can't talk about it, or it might be that uh, they assume that somebody else is looking after it. But this is a very important part of our business that we want to start to get to understand. We want to, when we want to encourage our staff to be able to talk about things that they are concerned about and to be able to move those things into the known unknowns environment. So that, remember I said, when we understand our risk, we are able to uh, apply a whole set of mitigations and take the steps that are required so that, um, that that thing that they're concerned about will not cause the organization harm. Or on the upside, 
it might be that we're able to explore an opportunity. And I'd like to engage with you now in um, my first poll with you, and I'm going to just bring that up. Um, many of you will uh, be familiar with the uh, VW um, emissions scandal. And I'd like to uh, explore with you just so that we really embed this concept of elephants and swans, your opinion on whether or not the um, VW emission scandal, was this an elephant or was this a swan? And you're gonna see it come up on your screens now. And let's, if, let's participate in this just to get your views. So ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's a very interesting response there. 161 of the people that are with us believe that is an elephant. But there are 10 people in, in the audience who believe it's a, it's a swan. And, and, and that is interesting because um, if there is that thought, um, it just goes to show that there can be this uh, blurring of, of, of just exactly what something is. Uh, last night, as I was doing some final research, I was exploring what um, uh, the consequences have been for VW. And um, um, perhaps those who have um, marked it as a swan would like to share with us why they believe it is a swan. Um, and, and we can and look at those thoughts a bit later through the conversation. But they, a lot of admission of guilt uh, people having been arrested and uh, court cases. Um, so yes, interesting. Um, um, who knew and who wasn't saying? And um, yes, right. I'm going to stop sharing that for now. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to be looking and unpacking a little bit more um, around a response strategy for these black swan, swan events. And perhaps you feel a lot like me, uh, enormous sense of pride if you look at the way that South Africa has dealt with, um, with this pandemic. We have um, our president who has shown absolute leadership, he's absolutely led from the front He's managed to secure the support of his, his, his ministers. Um, he's been able to um, secure the support of South Africa Incorporated, if I can refer to them like that. Everyone has got on board with him. The most incredible leadership. He has led with boldness and conviction. He has consulted widely and gained the support of his ministers, other leaders in his party, and widespread support of South African business. In true South African style, great men and captains of industry have come forward and pledged huge support and put money where their mouths are. There has been a display of deliberate solution orientation, deliberate actions, lever le leveraging of every possible means to salvage the situation and throw a lifeline to businesses and to people. All of you today who are participating in this presentation, you join as members of the Institute of Directors of South Africa. Many of you will be board members. Some of you might be aspiring directors or your executives of an organization on your way up the ladder and, 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 and your path may hold a tenure as a, as a director. You may be self-employed or you might be consulting to boards. Some of you may even be mentoring directors. 
But if you are a director, your role is an onerous and very responsible role. But on this occasion, with this pandemic that we're experiencing, I submit to you, as we reflect together on how to respond and to react to blonde, black swans, the, that the opportunity here is huge for you. The opportunity for you to also lead from the front, to be there for your organizations, to throw yourselves into it, to give absolute effect to what is required of you in terms of King Four. Just as our president and his ministers, his direct reports, his colleagues rally together, you and your fellow board members can do so too. You have the opportunity to lead from the front. I'm going to uh, take you through some um, examples of, of, of how I feel you can respond to, uh, to, to the situation. And, and for starters, you need to reflect as a director, and, and that is an, in, in, at any time. Um, the author of the book Black Swan, Nassim Talib, he, he did say that it is impossible to predict a black swan, but that they are possible is something that we've got to consider as a possibility, and we have to plan accordingly. Some of you may remember in um, 2009, the outbreak of the, the swine flu pandemic. And it was referred to as a pandemic. Um, and, and you may find it staggering to, to know that um, while it's always sad, the loss of lives, the, the death toll in that instance was 18,056 deaths. It uh, um, started in April 2009 and it had continued to um, uh, August of 2010. There were 1 1.6 um, confirmed cases. And to draw the contrast there, we had um, uh, with Corona, at the moment, there are 1.9 million cases. Um, and there have been 126,681 deaths. But I think to um, Nassim uh, Talib's point, we had that. If you look back uh, in your organizations before, was there preparation for that? Was there an opportunity to dust the um, uh, dust off the planning that went into planning for uh, the swine flu, which we seem to have much more of a lead time for it? Um, has that helped? Were, were you able to, to resort to that? Um, and, and, and in this instance, have you been able to, has your organization been able to um, look to their business continuity management. Uh, is it in, was it in place? Was it tested? Was it regularly updated? What about um, the disaster recovery plans? Same as I've described for the business continuity. And then once we've uh, engaged our um, business continuity uh, plans, are our business resumption plans there? Does that help us to recover, to, to get our businesses up and running again and to survive for starters and then to thrive. Were these simulations ever undertaken? What were the results of these? Were there anything, anything um, that uh, stood out there that we needed to, to fix? So the readiness, perhaps not so ready on this occasion, perhaps very ready on this occasion. And then to be responsive. How responsive has your organization been? Has it responded rapidly? Is your executive committee meeting daily, more than once a day if required? Have they put steering committees in place? Are they meeting regularly? How often are you being informed as a board member? How often is your board meeting? What is the quality of the, of the information that you're receiving for decision making? Are you able to be agile because of the information that you're receiving? What are your communications like as an organization? Are you getting that information you require? What are we saying to the staff? Are we, are we assuring them that the organization has got this? Um, what's expected of them? And that as an organization, we care about them. Our customers, if we're a bank, are we giving them the message that their money is safe? If we're a food re a retailer or food producer, 
Are we telling them it's okay, we can continue, food can be produced, it will be on the shelves of the grocery stores when you're there to buy it? What is the message to science, to society? If it's a mine, what is the message? Is it that we're able to tell them the mine won't cl close or we're unsure but there's something definite that they can cling on to in our messaging? Our regulators, are we giving them the message that the organization is okay? That it's liquid, it's well capitalized, especially if it's a systemically important organization? The government, are we supporting them? Are we acting in an advisory capacity where we can? Have we considered the various scenarios, but have we planned for the worst? If something better happens, at least we've planned for the worst. Have we been consulting experts or consultants, those that have been there and done that, got the t-shirt, experienced something, if not on this magnitude, at least something similar? Are we seeking and out to them for uh, information, for data that we can feed into our scenarios so we can feed it into our modeling. Have we stress test our decisions? Are we stress testing our decisions and our choices? Is the organization being responsible? Have we approved work from home? Have we given masks to our, our staff that might be working on the front, front line? And sure, there might be a shortage of stocks, but is there a home industry that we can support? Can we encourage people to be making them, but let's protect them? Are we taking the safety precautions that are required? Are we providing psychological um, assistance for those that are feeling the trauma? Um, daily communications, as I said a bit earlier, providing hope, giving direction, providing that certainty wherever it's possible. Are we looking at remuneration cuts? And I was looking at King 4, uh, 14 this morning where they talk about responsible remuneration. Are large bonuses being curtailed and without much resistance? Are there contributions to support the uh, solidarity funds? Are we paying our municipal pounds? Are we paying our rent to the landlords and to the property sector that's going to take enormous strain under this where we are able to? Are we asking our staff to um, take leave if that is going to help the organization to survive? In some instances, just to survive. And as organizations, are we paying our salaries? We might have much smaller organizations, but are we paying our salaries as long as this is possible? Resilience. Will the organization survive this crisis? Is it adequately um, uh, capitalized? Is there sufficient li liquidity? Has the organization survived uh, storms like this in the past? Have they got experience that they can draw on? Are they being innovative where they can? Um, and here I mentioned the leave, but yes, giving them, uh, making them leave, uh, leave the, the increases we spoke about, the reductions in the uh, executive pay, um, being resilient in the face of this uncertainty. And then keeping the organization running. As much as we need to be dealing with the pandemic, we have a, a, a business that we must make sure continues to operate and keeping the momentum. Those BCPs we spoke about, those DRPs, are they proving effective? Are the communications with our stakeholders regular, transparent and informative? All these actions maintaining momentum during these extraordinary times and freeing your staff up so that you create capacity for those that need to deal with the pandemic on the one side and the crisis and those that need to keep the boat afloat, so to speak. Are we relying on robust and regular risk and opportunity management? Are we identifying the risks? Are we looking at those worst case scenarios? Are we looking at the domino effect? Is your risk department heavily involved at the moment? Is your CRO part of your executive, part of your working group? Is he or she giving you a daily dashboard of risks that are emerging? What is your risk profile looking like? Are there some that are, are changing in their look and feel? You can imagine what government's risk profile looks like, 
Political risk may be shifting down a little bit, but social risk may be ratcheting up um, a little bit more. Crime, uh, we have fewer people on the streets, so crime numbers might be down, but we may see a uh, emergence of a different type of risk. Cyber risk might be, um, uh, be uh, stepping up. We have so many more people using technology and, and, and platforms where our emphasis on managing financial crime might need to be different. So your risk profile, it needs to be revised. That the, you need that revised almost daily if, if it's changing and, and presenting that to your board, your risk committee, uh, so that they're able to consider that and to assign necessary actions. Just as before I move on, and, and then the opportunities. What are the opportunities that are, are coming through from this? Um, we've seen some organization in manufacturing that have switched from one, one type of manufacture completely, some manufacturing masks. It's opened up a new business stream for them, um, and in, in this dreadful risk and threat, they've been able to maximize an opportunity there. Then looking at re-engineering, and preparing and planning for a new normal. When we, when we started, we, uh, we, we, we spoke through that the world as we know it may never be the same. Um, what, is, what does your new normal look like? What does your business look like going forward? Um, is there massive or, or small re-engineering that needs to, play, to take place? Have we had a big move from bricks and mortar to techni technology platforms and the use of applications? Is digitization in your organization maximized? If not, is there more we can do in that regard? Are you looking at your expense base and absolutely thoroughly? Are you looking at the supply chain? Where are the, the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities, the changes that we need to make? Which markets do we supply? Are we uh, needing to consider whether our business model needs to be revised and perhaps the target operating model as well. Plan, people, plan for a new normal. Refresh. Will we need to refresh the way we do our work? We've noticed that we're able to work from home. Sure, there's some difficulties, but for the most part, people have been able to do their work especially those that are office-bound, uh, typically. Do we need to uh, refresh our, our, the way we communicate? Do we need to look at our governance, delegation of authorities? Do we need to be restructuring? Do we need to be downsizing? Do we need to be right-sizing? How long do we have for this? In our plan, does it show how long we can operate as is? And then in the medium to long term, what those changes will look like. Will our organization remain relevant? Are there new product offerings that we need to be exploring? And quickly, is the organization sufficiently agile to address this and to stay relevant? What's the impact on your strategy and any revisions required? What does your organization look like when all of this is all over? So a, a re-engineering or a reinvention might not be absolutely necessary. In some instances, it might be that you just need to rejuvenate things. You may want to look at uh, your brand, your marketing, your advertising, your stakeholder engagement. Do we truly understand what their needs, their interests and expectations are? Are there any risks associated with that? Do we need to shake things up a little bit there and, uh, and, and rejuvenate that process, for example? Has this been an, an eye-opener for your organization? Did we perhaps become complacent in some cases? The same old, the same old. It's just not going to cut it anymore. The past may no longer serve us well in the future. It may not be sustainable. Your resourcing. Have we got the right capacity? Have we got the right capability? Is your organization a, real, a, a learning organization? Are they reflecting on this? What are the lessons that are going to be learned? I spoke about the swine flu. Did we take anything from that? Learning organizations um, um, uh, who possibly looked at the VW case in their time, they might have done a deep dive. They might have asked the question, is a VW possible in our organization? And if so, why? 
what are the things that um, make us vulnerable to something like that? So bad things do happen, and sometimes to good companies. And if we keep our a, a ready eye and boards insist that um, the organizations learn from the, the terrible things that happen to some organization, it can make our own organization so much better, so much more robust, robust, so much more able to withstand something like this, so much more able to be prepared for, for any eventuality. Have you had to manage your reputation and how pleased or otherwise have you been with how your organization has dealt with this? Last week, the session was on reputation and I'm sure you got some good tips out of that, but is that going well? Is the plan in place? Are we dealing with it? Are we restoring reputation where we have needed to and, and continuing um, um, as much as we would like to? Then reporting. Now you can imagine there are organizations right at this very moment that are putting out perhaps their interim um, reports, their, their financial booklets, their um, interim results presentations, or they might have had a 31 March uh, year end and they are just putting on the bells and whistles to their annual integrated reports. And there's a message, there's a message that's got to be given out there to the market, to the shareholders, to the investors, the stakeholders um, about uh, how the organization has created value. But hanging over the heads is something that has happened. And what does this look like in the short, medium and long term? Those who are doing interims, I think are probably in a, a more difficult uh, position, um, uh, caught right there, um, you know, and, and what are they gonna be saying? They need to consider the period right up until now and then and what, what, it, what it looks like right now and what it's going to mean into the future. But I'd like to guard uh, um, all of you against the type of the reporting that's taking place. Let's not allow our organizations to use COVID-19 as an excuse for not meeting the targets that are required. But let's allow ourselves to reflect and, and show um, our reader exactly what it's going to mean to our organization uh, and its future. So I think uh, um, getting to the end of, of this now is looking at um, being re realistic. We, we need to be able to uh, understand that this is, not, this is far from over. Uh, the effects and the impacts are going to continue for a long time. And we need to, as board, spend a lot of good time contemplating. Um, and adapting our strategies to uh, um, uh, the new reality. We, we need solutions, we need plans, we need quick and fast decisions, we need to be looking at scenarios, but they need to be realistic and not theoretical. And finally, um, for yourselves, um, this is where I think the opportunity lies. Um, you, you do have an opportunity here. Uh, what, what is the legacy that you're going to, to leave um, what are you going to be known for um, when, when, the, when we look back as an organization, as a country, as the world, through this dreadful time and, and what it's meant to everyone? What will they remember about um, uh, you as an individual? What will they remember about your particular board? What will they remember, um, as I think they're going to remember as South Africa as a bit of a standout in our leadership, as, as I've mentioned? Um, yeah, come out there, um, be decisive, be supportive, take the bold uh, steps that are required and, um, um, and, and be timely in your decision making. Uh, some of them might not be the most popular decisions, but they're going to be necessary. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I, so those are the uh, responses that I'd like to, and I'd just like to draw you a little bit more into the conversation again now and, and to have a look at um, um, some thoughts that you can share with us. I, I'm going to put this next one up for you and uh, let's see how we do. The, the question here is, do you feel your organization is navigating these unprecedented times adequately while main, maintaining business as usual and finding solutions? Let's see how you feel.
I'm going to end the poll now because I think the result is so interesting. You'll see that there are several in the, organ in the room or in the virtual room um, that you feel that is the case and, and that's very encouraging, just over 50%. Um, only 12% of you feel not, but it's the somewhat. Um, um, and, and perhaps perhaps you've got some ideas now, um, you know, it's uh, being ready is one thing, but it's taking hold of the situation as it is now. Um, uh, reaching out to peers, reaching out to specialists, consultants, um, whatever it takes to be able to improve that somewhat to a yes. Um, we are not able to engage in conversation with each other. Some of you may want to jot down a comment um, in the chat about what it is that is concerning you about what it is that somewhat is that's going to change to, to, a, uh, to a yes. You see that interesting result there. And clearly there are things to be done in that somewhat bucket. Back to the drawing board to, to, to make the changes that are required. We spoke about um, uh, the involvement of your risk um, a department, your chief risk officer. Can I have your view, please, on whether your board and executive committee is consulting with your CRO, with your risk departments, discussing the change in the risk profiles, the knock on risks and opportunities every time you meet, but particularly through this crisis? I'm going to close. I'm getting close there. I'm going to close it in a few seconds. But what is encouraging from where I'm sitting is that yes is certainly leading leading the the field there. Okay, I'm going to bring it to a close, um, and I'm going to share those results with you. Um, it is encouraging that 70% of you feel that the risk officer, the risk department is being involved, you're getting up to date, fresh risk information, dashboards, very useful. But what is it that is um, uh, causing that no to be the, the reply? And uh, please go out there, involve them in the future, be demanding of your, your risk uh, functions in your organization. Uh, get them to rise to the occasion. They need, they need to play their role if they're not. And they need to be welcomed into the space. Include them at your strategy sessions so that they can um, be part of the strategic risk assessments. Um, insist on, on, on real-time information. Make sure the profile is being adjusted as you need it and, it, and, and so that you can make those very important um, decisions. This one is very closely linked to your, um, to your, your risk again. Um, so you're now looking at whether or not you are satisfied with the completion of your organizer's relations risk profile. And this is not your risk register. These are those top 10 risks. They, those are the things that are keeping you awake at night. They are on your um, dashboard, your radar. Um, if, you, if you pulled it out today, if it was sent to you today, does it give you comfort that that is the, the position um, that you're in?
So these are results there. Um, a, a bit concerning again that um, the, the culture in some organizations will limit you about getting to know about your, the VWs in your organization. And that again is something that can be led from the front. Um, uh, again, inviting staff, management, giving them the assurance that we'd rather know what can hurt us. We'd rather know about the opportunities that uh, present themselves to the organization that we can maximize and, and take us to the next level. Um, there, I think as directors, as members of the executive, um, we have that in our power. Um, it's, it's not easy to do always, but if that invitation is extended to, to the people, workshop, brought in uh, people into rooms, ask their opinions. In, just, just imagine this, um, if, if we have a lot of people um, at their homes and we spoke about re-engineering earlier and what needs to change. Imagine if we sent out a poll, poll to our staff and said, you're reflecting at home, some of you might be able to work, some of you might. What do we do as an organization to change? What can we do differently? What can we do better? What can we do to survive? What can we do to, to surprise? I really believe that those, maybe those known unknowns might surprise us. There may be fabulous nuggets of information that we can get from our people and work with those. Here I'm asking you about um, the extent of the timelines and quality information that you are receiving for your decision making. Let's, let's have a look at what you, you think in this regard. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close that now and share those results with you. Again, very encouraging that it's at least adequate. Um, we're 57% and effective 30% 30, 30 so that takes us up to 87% of our people in the room are feeling that they've got at least information that they can work with and 30% and of that is effective. So that's absolutely fantastic. For those of you who have unfortunately had to say that it's poor, um, work to be done there and in your role as a director it's your right to get that that information but even being your right it's how how you you almost insist upon it um, sit with your people sit with your executives sit with your um, your risk your risk officers um, explain to them what you you want tell them it's not adequate when those uh, assessments are done of board effectiveness every year raise it um, uh, information data, it's absolutely vital. It's not possible to manage effectively uh, and, 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 and live out your, your very onerous roles. Um, and, and I do feel this is something you can take in hand almost immediately and insist upon it. And, and I hope I'm right and I hope you agree with me. Um, even those where you said it's adequate, uh, heed my words here, request that information, sit with them, show them, uh, let them see it through your eyes where you feel the information is not effective. In the pandemic, um, uh, it, it, the turnaround time needs to be a bit quicker. The agility of the organization to attend to your needs will be tested here. And it's a good test. Expect it of them. Demand it of them. Question here um, is whether or not your organization um, will have to align its uh, strategy to the new normal, the new future. Let's see what that looks like. Well, wow. um, ladies and gentlemen, that's a, that's a fascinating result. Just look at that. Will your organization have to realign its strategy to the new normal, the new future? 91% are saying so. 
that's incredible. So that sounds like a, um, when, when the dust settles and who knows when that's gonna be. But um, it sounds like June boards, if it's June when you meet or July boards, there might have to be um, um, the strategy pulled out a, a strategic review uh, update, uh, strategic risk assessment, but clearly there's work to be done here. Um, and then that just shows you the enormity of what is, is, is going on and, 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 and the impact on organizations. For those that say no, the lucky few, uh, go back and just check that, just to be absolutely certain. If you are making representations in integrated reports and uh, half yearly results, um, that Outlook uh, is going to want to know that. What is, uh, you know, is, is there any change uh, that is required to your strategy? Right, just um, a second last one. You, as a director, you're concerned about how um, uh, the organization will message the impact and how we dealt with the black swan in our annual integrated uh, report or in your interims. Yes. It may be used as an excuse or no, you seek to still produce uh, a balanced report uh, taking into effect the, the consequences and impacts and implications. Ladies and gentlemen, um, an interesting result there. Um, and, and thank you um, for, for sharing it as you have. Um, uh, there is work to be done around um, the accuracy, the transparency, the balanced reporting. Um, and, and again, it's, uh, it's a unique situation. It has thrown things on its head, um, but reflection uh, to get to the right message um, is correct. Thank you very much for participating in those um, um, the polls. It's been fascinating to get your very honest replies. I, in the presentation that you will receive, I have provided some details and support of those summaries that we're going through in our responses. <clears throat> so those are there for you to look back on, um, should you so wish to do. And um, as I say, they, those are there. So I'm, I'm going to thank you very much for participating with me today. And, and I'd just like to um, uh, leave you with um, a message that um, it, it is a tough time um, when, we, when we look back on, on this and we will have a, a story to tell. Uh, it, it needs to be a good story. Uh, we have this incredibly onerous role. We need to do our jobs. If efficiently and, and, and the best way we can and, and, and make use of this time um, to really just make a difference and, and to go out there every day uh, thinking about those um, who, who need our assistance, uh, looking at what the knock-on effects are. If I, if I think what really concerns me the most is this black swan is the pandemic. What about other um, things that are, are facing us. And here I think about water shortages. We know about it, it's a known known. But the day the water is switched off, will it become our black swan? We've, we know the difficulties we've had with electricity. Are we planning around these things? And, and now to wish you well. Um, I know the organizers may want to open up to questions now, and um, perhaps we can have a look and see if, if there are any that are, are coming in here. I see there are some um, uh, questions that have come in and um, I'll just have a look at some of these. Um, why has this virus caught the world unexpected? Um, um, asks, asks one of the gentlemen in the organization. It's not totally unexpected if we consider the swine flu and history. Uh, what made us so smug? Did we believe in antibiotics um, for viruses? Um, so that doesn't explain it. Um, Yeah, why has this world, this quarter, so unexpected? I explained earlier that I believe that um, 
um, we, we did have the benefit of a practice round, but never on this, on this magnitude. Um, someone, uh, uh, Sifu uh, writes, I have my concerns and am in between to whether this COVID-19 pandemic is a black swan or not. Another, um, Ayanda asks, at what point do you become ready for and responsive to a black swan event, especially if you have no clue of what it is likely to be and how likely it is to affect us? What do you prepare and how do you prepare? Um, again, um, my examples that I used for you is where bad things happen to organizations. Can you survive that? Are you vulnerable to those kind of things? If you are vulnerable, what are those vulnerabilities and what do you need to do um, um, to, to uh, be able to sustain uh, your survival in, the, in, those, in those instances? Anna asks, what will be on board agendas going forward? How do we retain jobs? Or how do we just cut costs, which was result in further job losses, an excuse for poor strategic planning and vision? And again, this is uh, using the foresight. Um, there are going to have to be some hard, uh, hard calls. But if we remember um, uh, ourselves as an organization, we're the local stakeholders, and we've got to give uh, um, to all. It can't be cold and callous. It has to be well through. Um, so I think that uh, on the board agendas, um, it should be there. And, um, and we should be talking about these things. There are many questions here, many, many questions, and thank you for those. I think in the interest of time now, we have five minutes left. Um, there may be opportunity for um, um, the Institute of Directors to uh, maybe assemble us again on an occasion and, um, and, and, and perhaps some of the more, more um, common questions in here. We can look, uh, Vicky, at a um, frequently asked question uh, reply type of scenario or um, you, you'll probably have better suggestions than I have, will have in this regard. Yes, thank you, Shirley, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We have run over our time, um, and as Shirley has said, we will work together and we'll try and do an FAQ to answer some of the questions that have been posed. Um, so thank you very much for everyone attending. Shirley, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us this morning. Um, from the comments that have been received, it looks like it was a really useful session and has left everyone with things to think about and take back to the boardroom. Um, everyone, thank you again, once again, and please do complete our event satisfaction survey after you leave. See you all next week. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you and goodbye, everyone.